how I came to this uh, how I came to this particular topic, uh, despite spending the last three years writing a book about the the global history of Japanese menswear from 1600 to uh, the 1930s. Uh, this geisha research project has been beckoning me from the sidelines the entire time as I have immersed myself in the Kyoto geisha community. I've lived in Kyoto now for 21 years and I have participated in many geisha ozashiki parties and for over a decade I have also in addition to being a professor served as a professional guide and translator for many foreign tourists who would like to have access to this cloistered world. And for about the last year, a fellow geisha enthusiast and I have organized monthly online ozashiki performances that allow viewers outside of Japan to gain access to being able to see Kyoto geisha and Maiko dance and also be able to talk directly through them through the power of Zoom. And all the while, my historian's training has constantly left me uneasy about contemporary rhetoric about timeless geisha traditions. Timeless is always a red flag to any historian. I don't mean, however, that I want to be an iconoclast and tear down the stories that now structure how many geisha and Michael understand their work. I mean, instead, that the evidence all around us suggests that these traditions exist because women before our time were extremely savvy, dedicated, and creative and left this legacy for contemporary geisha. It was they who built the current geisha world, and we do them a disservice to assume that their primary contribution was as custodians. By peeling away the rhetoric of timeless traditions, then, I aim to build up a new renewed admiration for women who often, despite heartbreaking circumstances that they themselves had often not chosen, nevertheless mustered the courage to meet life with an admirable dose of creativity and even beauty. This then is how today's presentation has beckoned me. But there's one more spark that has inspired this work as well, and that is this remarkable building in downtown Kyoto, which has for decades always struck me as just a little bit strange, even weird. So I want to begin with this building. In 1927, the startling new building cast long shadows over the tiled roofs and narrow alleys of Kyoto's Pontacho Geisha district. Four stories framed by steel girders and clad with fashionable yellow bricks and handmade tiles, the building towered over tea houses of wood, tile, and paper. It was even rumored that the building had taken inspiration from Frank Lloyd Wright's Imperial Hotel in Tokyo, completed just the year before. This building looked nothing like the one it replaced, a rambling hulk of timber put up in 1895 and which had served the community for two decades as the home of the annual public geisha dances called the Kamogawa Odori. It also housed the district's Nyokoba, or the school originally started in the 1870s to give prostitutes and geisha useful life skills so that they could quit the profession. But that mission had been abandoned decades ago, and now the old building groaned under the weight of an increasing number of girls and young women who turned to geisha work in the 1920s. Although the building underwent significant renovations in 1904, the old Caborenjo had nevertheless grown shabby amidst glamorous new cafes, department stores, movie theaters, and dance halls that were sprouting up all across Kyoto. Even so, some must have surely looked at this brick and steel hulk with its carpeted floors and wondered if Pontecho might have gone just a little bit too far. But the district's business leaders and geisha were delighted. As one business owner wrote, to avoid falling behind the times and self-destruction of the geisha, we must improve and elevate the geisha and the district. If we do, there is surely a boundless future ahead. The Caborenjo then 
anchored the geisha in a broader entertainment landscape of spectacle, fantasy, and play. Yet scholars have largely excised geisha from the story of Japan's interwar cultural modernity. They've preferred instead to focus on the modern girl or the moga and the new urban spaces of play that she appropriated, such as cabaret reviews, movie theaters, dance halls, coffee shops, and department stores. By comparison, small ozashiki gatherings of geisha and wealthy male clients seems to be a rusty relic of a fading entertainment landscape created in the age of shoguns. The result of this scholarly attention to the geisha's more glamorous sister has been a rich vein of work highlighting how the moga challenged women's confinement to home and traditional moral standards. As Miriam Silverberg writes in a seminal essay, the moga appeared to be a free agent without ties, affiliation, effect, or obligation to lover, father, father, mother, husband, or children. In a similar vein, the modern girl around the world research group declared that the moga revealed an unstable and sometimes subversive relationship to social norms relating to heterosexuality, marriage, and motherhood. Because of this superb scholarship, we have a strong sense of the MOGA's revolutionary potential to overturn entrenched ideologies and the way her body became a site of public contest. Geisha bodies, by contrast, have proven less compelling to scholars. After all, many women, no girls, were trafficked into the profession and their indenture often forced them to perform occasional sex work and to endure frequently harsh working conditions. The subject of feminist critique even by her contemporaries, combined with her traditional demure appearance and an array of toxic orientalist geisha girl stereotypes have all combined to make geisha far less mesmerizing than her moga sisters. Geisha lives then, have seemed useful mostly as an example of musty patriarchal ideologies that the MOGA were so stylishly demolishing. As one of our best scholars of interwar culture, Elise Tipton writes, the geisha represented the traditional woman, whereas the cafe waitress or jokyu was a modern girl. I use this paper, however, to challenge this formulation because we have largely assumed that geisha were confined to private ozashiki parties, we have overlooked the innumerable ways that geisha work actually intersected with an emerging urban popular culture of leisure and spectacle. Scholarship on the moga and on interwar popular culture more generally has emphasized the intense visuality of taisho and early showa popular culture as the Modern Girl Around the World Research Group has written, the MOGA was a female performance and spectacle that marked the unprecedented public visibility of young women in the early 20th century. Elisa Friedman, Laura Miller, and Christine Yano have likewise emphasized that the MOGA was predicated on the urban act of seeing and the appearance of more young women in public places. In this vein, I argue that geisha made themselves surprisingly visible across a broad swath of popular culture. Geisha were featured on postcards and collectible photos. Some became recording artists and even movie stars. They were contestants in newspaper-sponsored beauty contests. They performed for countless civic events, encouraged local tourism, and choreographed public dances, or odori, that became major events in the annual calendar of towns and cities all across the nation. In short, geisha were deeply embedded in the same culture of spectacle that the moga used to titillate and to alarm. More than that, I argue that geisha also adapted their work to an evolving entertainment landscape. The results might strike us as peculiar or even forced, but they demonstrate something scholars so far have largely overlooked, that interwar geisha 
were very much immersed in the same culture of spectacle as the Moga. By su suggesting parallels with the Moga, I do not mean simply the catchy images that juxtaposed geisha with cars or cameras or newspapers or other tropes of modernity. What I mean is a deeper and more sustained engagement between geisha and mass consumer culture and the challenges her labor presented to dominant gender norms. After all, as Jan Bardsley has observed, the geisha has long been an ambiguous figure, uncomfortably associated with accumulated wealth, independence outside marriage and single motherhood. Kelly Foreman has likewise chronicled the long history of anxiety that women on stage have provoked and uh, has also indicated that a rather surprising picture of independent, free-thinking bad girls who chose to bypass marriage and family. This paper then seeks to restore the geisha to the range of interwar women's activities and identities that pushed women into startling public visibility. Moga then were not just drinking cocktails at jazz clubs, they were also strutting on stage at the glamorous odori performances all across Japan and singing and playing instruments while hundreds of dazzled fans luxuriated in the spectacle of it all. To explore these ideas in some detail, I'm going to divide today's presentation into two major sections. In the first, which I'll call public geisha, we will survey the range of public facing work that geisha performed from the late Meiji through the early Showa years and the way that this work gave them a unique public visibility. In the second section, which I'll call modern geisha, I'll turn to explore the Pontecho Geisha district in Kyoto in particular and how its business leaders and geisha work together to modernize the district and integrate it into a larger popular culture centered around dining, shopping, and spectacle. I'll then conclude with some thoughts about how we might think of geisha along a spectrum of unruly female public behavior in Japan's interwar period. So let us begin by first demonstrating the ways that geisha work kept them in the public eye for well over two centuries. Though the image of geisha is one of confinement to the okia, residence, and the private ozashiki, geisha of the Edo, Meiji, Taisho, and early Showa periods paraded themselves before the public in a variety of guises. The visibility of geisha in this way long predated the Moga's startling arrival. We have all, for instance, seen Edo period ukiyo-e prints of various famed beauties or bijin, and these floating world prints and paintings often focused on individual geisha or on the spectacle of the larger geisha quarters, such as this painting of the famed Fukugawa geisha district in Edo. These prints and paintings paid lavish attention to geisha style and visual presentation. The introduction of mass circulation newspapers during the Meiji period also kept geisha before the public eye with titillating stories of geisha behaving badly. Here, for instance, we see a story about a Kyoto geisha who's horrified by a dirty old woman selling coal and she gets a tongue lashing. What's so funny, barks the coal seller. I'm all black and selling coal and you're all white and selling songs and dances. Seems like the same business to me. Or there was the story of Oume, a Tokyo geisha who murdered an employee of her ochaya for embezzling funds. Her trial was a newspaper sensation and her shocking story kept the geisha in the public eye. As woodblocks gave way to photography, geisha remained a favorite subject. Indeed, some of the earliest commercial photos we have of Japanese women are of celebrated geisha. Geisha were a popular subject for tourist photography as well, and their images were also available for domestic consumption and in the form of countless cheap bromides at souvenir stands or at photography studios specializing in albums for foreign travelers. 
In this way, geisha lives and habits came to visualize, at least for foreign travelers, the lives and habits of presumably most quote unquote Japanese women. In this way, the geisha became a stand in for all Japanese women. By the late 19th and early 20th centuries, local newspapers also published geisha faces in beauty contests. One of the first was an 1891 celebration for the opening of a 12-story, 77-meter-high brick tower in Asakusa called the Roonkaku, where organizers sponsored a beauty contest between 100 of Tokyo's most prominent geisha. Other cities followed suit. Here, for instance, are postcards showing two contestants of a geisha beauty contest in Kyoto, sponsored by the local paper, the Kyoto Hinode. That is, despite changes in mass visual communication, from woodblock prints to commercial photography and early newspapers, geisha remained among the most publicly visible women in Japan. Many towns and cities, in fact, published, uh, pushed geisha forward as the prized local asset that could lure domestic tourists and boost the local economy. Business leaders produced illustrated guidebooks to their town's geisha quarters, such as this late 19th century one from Nagoya offering pictures and names of a hundred local geisha beauties. These books frequently not only introduced each geisha, they also described the district's charms and practical information about places to stay and to eat. Another Nagoya guide from 1925 even shows a geisha encouraging readers to visit Juichia, a local department store. A similar guide from 1903 promoted the geisha of Osaka Shincho district, provided detailed maps and pictures of the best known geisha, and which allowed travelers to make advance plans and to coordinate the visit with other activities in the nearby area. But geisha were not confined to specialized guidebooks specifically about geisha. Local sightseeing guides often included information about the town's geisha and prostitution districts, such as this Fukui city guide from 1940 that marks out the geisha and prostitution quarters among the city's other tourist worthy highlights. What's perhaps most striking, however, was the way these guidebooks put geisha at the center of local history identity, and even local progress. At a time when men excised women from any public role in shaping the local economy, men nevertheless celebrated the contributions geisha made in boosting regional developments. As local beauties or bijin, moreover, geisha were among the very few women publicly appointed to represent a town or a city's identity such as these celebrated Bijin types from Osaka and Nagasaki. Finally, local guidebooks also touted the long history of their geisha districts, and in so doing, acknowledged the role of women in shaping local history. A 1925 guide to the geisha of Hokkaido, for instance, begins not with a description of the geisha districts, but with two chapters describing the island's history before then going on to tour the geisha districts. In so doing, the book made the implicit case that geisha were playing a part in modernizing the island and giving it its unique character. In a similar vein, this 1928 Nagasaki guidebook makes the case that its fabled Maruyama pleasure quarters played a sustained role in shaping Nagasaki's history and its global engagements, not just with the Dutch, but with the Chinese as well. In short, geisha were among the very few women publicly recognized as symbols of civic pride and local identity and publicly acknowledged for their contributions to regional economic development, local history, and local identity. In fact, throughout the opening decades of the 20th century, city officials all across Japan considered geisha such an important part of the local community that they frequently called upon them to help celebrate civic milestones. In 1918, for instance, officials in Tsuroka celebrated the opening of their first railroad station by inviting geisha to dance. 
when city leaders in another part of Japan, perhaps Niigata, celebrated 50 years as an open port, they invited geisha to dance. When Teradomari City laid the foundation stone for its new harbor reconstruction in 1915, they invited geisha to dance. When Fukugawa Park reopened in 1929 after planting new cherry trees, festival organizers invited geisha to dance. When the 45th annual seed and seedling exchange opened, they invited geisha to dance. When business leaders wanted to promote economic ties between Okinawa and Kyushu, they asked geisha to dance. And despite grumbling from some reformers who feared that geisha would give the nation a black eye on the international stage, geisha also paraded to celebrate the enthronement of the Taisho Emperor. Then, in 1914, geisha were given a prominent place in festivities around the opening of the Tokyo Taisho Exposition. Hundreds of geisha served as greeters, and they were also given a prominent place in the festivities where they were asked to perform. Through this brief survey of the public geisha, we've seen that whether as titillating bad girls or beauty contestants or boosters of the local economy, geisha maintained a strikingly public profile at a time when women were supposed to be at home. Geisha were not cloistered behind pleasure quarter walls like the courtesans and prostitutes of old Edo, nor did city elders call upon them to beat back modernization. On the contrary, they were among the very few women publicly acknowledged for their contributions to economic development, civic progress, and local identity. Even critics who complained that geisha were an embarrassment nevertheless reveal just how often geisha were invited to appear at major civic events. In short, few other classes of women had a higher public profile and were, for better or worse, more tightly woven into local entertainment and local identity. Geisha of the Taisho and early Showa periods were not content to simply be visible, nor were they interested merely preserving old traditions. Instead, they strategized about how to integrate their work into a shifting urban entertainment landscape. To chart this story, I'll focus on the Pontecho district in Kyoto as an example of how interwar geisha made often striking efforts to modernize their profession and their image to meet new client expectations. I want to begin this section by returning to the 1927 Pontecho Theater or Cabarenjo where we started. I think this building helps reveal how Pontecho geisha self-consciously integrated themselves and their work into the broader culture of urban spectacle, fantasy, and play. In planning this new Cabarenjo, the district could have hired the same Kyoto carpenters who, in 1913, had put up Gion's Kaburenjo. That building showcased the annual Miyako Odori Geisha dances, provided a space for the Geisha school, for the Geisha of Gion, and also offered guests stately waiting rooms. But Pontecho's Geisha and business owners had instead dug deep into their savings and commissioned a leading Osaka engineering firm best known for state-of-the-art theaters. The Obayashi Construction Company had just completed the Shochikuza Theater in Osaka, a movie palace that seated over 1,000 and that doubled as a home to an all-female musical review called the Osaka Shochiku Kagekidan, or the OSK. The Pontecho Geisha and business leaders, therefore, knew what they were getting by commissioning Obayashi Construction. Weary of taunts that the long, narrow alleys made Pontecho feel like an eel's bed, geisha and business owners now took pride, as one wrote, that we've been able to build this beautiful building that towers over the district. More than just a kaburenjo to host the annual Kamogawa Odori and to provide space for the geisha school, 
the new building was designed to push the geisha forward into the modern age. The Pontecho Caborenjo did not stand all alone, however. Looking northeast from the Caborenjo's commanding heights, as we are seeing here, one saw little more than traditional tiled roofs as far as the eye stretched. But turning to the south and the southeast, one could immediately see that the districts that the geisha districts and business leaders had placed their new building within a larger context of new nearby construction. Between 1926 and 1929, three other major buildings joined Pontecho's Caborenjo along the same stretch of the Kamogao River. The boom began in 1926, right at the southern terminus of Pontecho when the American architect William Merrill Voris built a Spanish revival confection. Called Yao Matza, it housed a Western style restaurant and beer hall. That same year and right across the river, it was the building of another building called Kiksi, a striking new concrete structure with hints of art deco and expressionism. It too had a Western style restaurant on the first floor, a cocktail bar on the second, and private event space on the floors above. And sandwiched between these two buildings, and these two restaurants, was the imposing new concrete and steel Minamiza Kabuki Theater, which opened in 1929 after replacing an older wooden building on the same spot. Though adopting more traditional Momoyama period architectural flourishes, it nevertheless used the most modern techniques in theater design and construction technology. More than just their Western touches made these buildings so startling. After all, Kyoto already had a number of banks, post offices, museums, and government offices in Western style, but these had largely serviced the Meiji state or the needs of the elite. The Pontecho Caborenjo and its neighbors, by contrast, marked a new architectural playfulness that embraced visual exuberance and a middle-class culture of spectacle and leisure. Moreover, all four of these buildings were within a simple walk of no more than five minutes. Here, for instance, is a post-war photo taken from an upper floor of Yaomasa restaurant showing the southern entrance to the Pontecho district and the Caborenjo at the northern end. And in May, when the Kamogawa Odori would run every year for three weeks, the program frequently included advertisements for these neighbors, Yaomasa and Kikusui, suggesting that just a short walk away, clients could extend the playful Odori mood. Indeed, advertisements in the annual Odori programs frequently directed visitors to a wide range of consumer experiences, many of them self-consciously modern. There were, for instance, beer halls and photography studios. There were pianos and radios. There were Western umbrellas, women's shawls and phonograph records. There were cosmetics and there were hats. And above all, loomed the big department store sponsors like Marubutsu near Kyoto Station, which lured customers with the fetching claim that it was a palace of fashionable goods. That is by directing visitors to a range of modern consumer goods and experiences, Pontecho integrated its geisha into this broader stream of consumer culture. The range of goods advertised especially for women such as gynecologists or wigs for traditional dance, also make it clear that women attended the annual Odori programs just as excited as men to see the geisha perform. All these advertisements then helped make Pontecho's geisha an important constituent in this culture of modern consumerism and recreation. Although today, the Kamogawa and Miyako Odori are over a century old. In the 1920s and 1930s, they were still something of a fad and a relatively recent innovation in geisha entertainment. 
rather than highlighting the skills of a single or a pair of geisha, Odori choreographers jam the stage with dozens of women all dressed alike and performing in synchronized movements. The idea seems to have started in the early Meiji period among some innovative geisha in Furuichi in Ise. Hoping to entice clients from among the many pilgrims to Ise Shrine, Furuichi's geisha created a dance spectacular called the Kamenoko Odori, which was held in a large hall with a wide stage that gave clients the chance to look over all the available geisha and to select a favorite. Gion's dance master went to see too and came back with ideas about how to produce the Miyako Odori. Both Gion and Pontacho launched themselves into this new Odori format in 1872, when city leaders invited these two top geisha districts to help revive Kyoto's ailing fortunes. Following the devastation of moving the capital to Tokyo, Kyoto city leaders put on a series of annual exhibitions or hakurankai designed to boost the city's crafts and industry, as well as to promote tourism and investment. To entice visitors, city elders called upon the geisha of Gion and Pontacho to entertain the public with dances. Gion responded by putting on the Miyako uh, Odori and Pontacho uh, offered the Kamogawa Odori. Although the Gion and Pontacho uh, uh, had started these as a diversion for exhibition visitors, over the next 40 years, these odori became a popular entertainment in their own right. They were so popular, in fact, that Gion and Pontacho both staged there as an annual event, and revenues were sufficient to build imposing kaburenjo theaters that could accommodate the growing press of fans eager to see the novelty. In fact, the Odori performances became so renowned that Gion and Pontacho Geisha were invited to even recreate them in Tokyo. In 1915, for instance, 100 Pontacho Geisha were invited to Tokyo to spend nine days staging their famed Kamogawa Odori at the Kabukisa Theater in Tokyo. Kyoto's geisha also helped to inspire geisha all across Japan to put on similar performances, often called odori or ondo, that generated renewed enthusiasm in geisha entertainment. So for instance, the geisha of Morioka created the Kaneyama odori. The geisha of Akita put on the Akita ondo. The geisha of Sendai produced the Miyazaki ondo odori and the geisha of Hiroshima produced the Miyajima Odori. Towns embraced these geisha spectacles and promoted them as one of their select meibutsu, or celebrated local products. To keep customers returning, geisha districts often changed the performances regularly and even competed to hire well-known contemporary writers set designers and costume designers to craft novel displays that would bring people back to see again. Pontacho Geisha were particularly innovative at using the Odori format to experiment with new performance styles. Not only did the district change dance schools in 1927, the year of the, they debuted the, the Kaburenjo, changed from the Shinozuka to the Wakayagi, the geisha also took on entirely new styles of modern dance and music as well. In 1935, for instance, the opening scene of the odori created a mind-bending pastiche of ancient Shinto legend and modern Western music. A local, report, a local paper reported that the female kami, Ame no Uzume no Mikoto, whom the kojiki, or uh, tales of ancient records, credited with luring the sun goddess Amaterasu from her cave and appeared on the Pontacho stage accompanied by six dancers bearing Western instruments. During the dance, golden light appeared from behind the cave rock and gradually illuminated the stage as the scenery changed to a magnificent backdrop of Mount Fuji engulfed in cherry blossoms. Exactly which Western instruments were used 
and how is unfortunately unclear. But an odd local reporter could only marvel that the Kamogawa Odori of the Meiji and Taisho periods has passed away. And this was no one-off experiment. All through the 1930s, the geisha of Pontecho incorporated new dance styles and Western instruments into the Kamogawa Odori format. Organizers understood that they might be taking risks with some audience members. Such a dance may not be liked by the visitors from abroad, the 1934 program observed, yet it is amusing to look at. Besides, it's rather an interesting sight to get a glimpse of the times. As part of this campaign to keep up with the times, Pontecho produced an entirely new odori every year. It hired leading popular writers to pen new song lyrics, and set designers to produce novel backdrops that would accompany the 12 different scenes that were produced annually. Meanwhile, teachers in the Wakayagi School of Dance unleashed all their creativity, choreographing a range of dances keyed to themes, both traditional and modern. While the Kambogawa Odori often clustered these scenes around classical poetry or famous scenery or beloved tales, just as often, the Odori themes were set in contemporary times and commented on current events. In 1934, for instance, the Odori's overall theme was the beautiful country Japan. And the seventh scene, which we see the painted backdrop here, was titled The Beauty of the Warrior. This scene transported the audience to the deck of a modern day battleship. Geisha danced while Western instruments played and singers praised the sailor's life and the Yamato spirit of the Japanese sailors out at sea. For the dazzling 1938 finale titled The Pride of Japan, Geisha crowded the stage and danced before a set festooned with a war plane and Japanese, Manchurian, Italian, and Nazi German flags. From the sides, Geisha sang Mount Fuji and Sakura are the pride of Japan. The morning light shines. No reflects the emperor's majestic light shining high and bright, lighting the world. In both its Kaburenjo and in its annual Odori, Pontacho self-consciously sought to shed its image as a shabby, narrow eel's bed and to burnish a reputation as a progressive and up-to-date geisha district. Geisha and business leaders were particularly eager to distinguish themselves from their long-standing rival across the Kamogawa River in Gion. This is eloquently borne out by this 1928 photo spread that appeared in the magazine Gige Krabu, with the immaculately dressed Gion Maiko entertaining in classic style along the Kamogawa River on the right, while the opposite page features a Pontecho geisha dressed in a striking summer one-piece dress and sun hat while declaring, no, I'm not traveling abroad. Even visitors noted the difference. In his 1929 survey of the nation's geisha districts, the Tokyo-based writer Matsukawa Jiro conceded that there is no doubt that Gi owns the place and you'll never get the true Kyoto Kagai atmosphere in Pontecho. But, he continued, Pontecho was a good deal friendlier and more relaxed, and, as he put it, that makes it feel modern. He, had, he advised first timers coming to Kyoto for geisha entertainment then to head not to Gion, but to what he called small, cozy Pontecho. But Pontecho's efforts to modernize did not just target Gion. After all, geisha all over Kyoto had to battle dozens of new entertainment options that lured clients away to cafes, jazz clubs, movie theaters, and department stores. Pontecho was unique, however, in coming up with strategies self-consciously designed to update the geisha's work and image. So for instance, while Gion worked hard to nurture an image of its Maiko as icons of proper Japanese girlhood, Pontecho took a rather different approach. Borrowing from the popular stage and female review format, 
Pontecho organized some of its youngest girls into what it called the Pontecho Review Dan, or the Girls Review. At this point of research, I'm not sure how and when exactly it was organized, but in the 1930s, it performed at a number of events, both inside and outside of the Pontecho district. In 1931, for instance, they performed here at the Pontecho's annual year opening ceremony, where an admiring reporter observed that it's obviously necessary to keep up with the times. Three years later, in 1934, the Pontecho Geisha organized a fundraiser for Japanese officers and troops serving in Manchuria, and the Pontecho Rebu Dan uh, entertained the crowd with a reported 12 dances, including a jazz dance, another one that was called Tango Lisa, and a third titled The Skater's Waltz, as well as four numbers in a more traditional style. At another point in the 1930s, it seems that they also were invited to perform in Tokyo. This review format marked Pontecho's leading role in a movement within the geisha community to incorporate popular modern dance into their repertoire. This phenomenon became known as dance geisha or dance geisha, and teachers set up shop in three of Kyoto's districts, Pontecho, Miyagawacho, and Kitashinchi. Gion flatly refused to participate. The teachers were outside the formal uh, classes that Geisha and Michael were required to take, and the issue was controversial enough to inspire a 1931 roundtable discussion outlining the pros and cons of this latest fad. But Pontecho pushed ahead and noted that the popularity of the dance Geisha was so great that in the near future, it was likely that all Geisha would need to learn modern social dancing. The geisha also got practice when, in 1933, the Pontecho Caburenjo received an official city license to operate a dance hall under the provision that all the dancers for hire were in fact Pontecho geisha. Pontecho's geisha then were hardly shrinking back into a fading world of wood and silk. With their new Caburenjo and a dance hall on the top, with their young girls in a dance review, they announced themselves part of an emerging modern urban culture of spectacle, play, and fantasy. In this, as we've seen, they were hardly alone. Geisha all across Japan jumped on the bandwagon and were widely recognized for their capacity to hold public attention. There is, for instance, this memorable 1936 news release from Jiji Shinpo showing a stylish young Tokyo Shinbashi Geisha receiving a diploma declaring that she has now been trained to do everything from speak fluent English to dance the tango. Pontecho then was part of a wave of Geisha reconceptualizing the nature of their profession amidst competition from a range of new entertainment options. While some districts like Gion had sufficient prestige and clientele to bear down on highbrow respectability, Pontecho and other districts across Japan could only keep afloat by demonstrating their capacity to satisfy client needs in an age of spectacle. Contemporary Kyoto, Michael, and Geisha, as Jan Bardsley has so brilliantly shown, maintain an image of cloistered exclusivity and as repositories of timeless Japanese, particularly feminine culture. Yet this image is yet another innovation in geisha work. This one, I believe, caused by changes in the post-war entertainment landscape. Pre-war geisha all across Japan, including the elite Gion district, worked alongside prostitutes. The 1956 prostitution prevention law, therefore, required the districts to once again reimagine their role in the entertainment business and to redefine the geisha profession. Brothel owners had long been a powerful business constituency within geisha districts, but their reduced influence now, geisha could now shift their image to something a little more palatable. But at this point, my research is just simply too preliminary to do more than guess about how Geisha went from what I call the modern to the museum. But for today, 
I focused on the 1920s and 1930s to demonstrate the creative ways that geisha responded to new modes of popular entertainment. I think scholars have largely overlooked the evidence we've seen today together, preferring to explore the image of the geisha, whether in Japan or abroad. And that's understandable, given how hard it is to recover the individual lives and motivations of these interwar geisha. Flipping through the old odori programs, we can be overwhelmed by the vast silence of these women who we know were making hard choices in a tumultuous time, but whose voices have almost disappeared. So today I've tried to recover some of that agency, first by presenting both visual and textual evidence to uh, try to demonstrate how geisha integrated their lives and work within a broader urban consumer culture. As we've seen, they saw themselves as a constituent in the birth of modern culture of spectacle. Second, I've suggested a broader framework for analyzing interwar geisha, specifically by seeing her as part of a continuum of moga behavior rather than the Moga's antithesis. Like other forward women of their generation, Geisha found self-expression in public display and a rejection of the good wife and wise mother ideology that would confine them to home. There are obviously important differences between the degree to which Moga and Geisha could claim self-determination, but we should not underestimate just how imaginatively geisha responded to new forms of entertainment and spectacle, and just how far outside they remained from an ideology of bourgeois morality and women's domestic confinement. And just like their Moga contemporaries, geisha were among the most publicly visible and even daring women of interwar Japan. Let me reinforce all these points then by ending with a guidebook I mentioned earlier. This 1925 guide to the geisha districts of Hokkaido is a remarkable document for many reasons. But what strikes me most are the portrait photos. Kyoto's odori programs like this always show hundreds of women in nearly identical dress and hairstyle and pose. But the geisha of Hokkaido give us hints about the real women pulled into the vortex of this profession and who did the best they could to make it their own. The Hokkaido book, for example, shows us a range of different geisha. We see geisha as friends. We see geisha as flirts. We see geisha as apprehensive young girls uncertain about the future. We see geisha as mothers. We see geisha as serious students of the stage. We see geisha as stylish modern girls. We see geisha as athletes and geisha as proud masters of the Gidayu repertoire. In short, these photos restore the multiple faces of interwar geisha too often hidden under post-war stereotypes of the geisha girl. I believe these photos restore their agency to define for themselves amidst a wide range of possibilities and to declare that self publicly. And they remind us of the enormous creativity of women navigating the culture of interwar spectacle and mass consumer culture. I hope then that today's presentation has suggested a path forward for integrating geisha more fully into our histories of interwar Japanese culture. And with that, I will offer my ogini as a thank you for your attention. And because this is a brand new research project for me, I am particularly eager to get your comments on what might be improved and any insights that you have as well about your own expertise that can bring to bear on this material. So with that, I will stop the share screen and we can then proceed onwards. Let me get a drink of water. 
Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, so questions, comments, suggestions to Gavin um, in whatever format feels most comfortable for you. You've got a couple of questions there, Kevin. Maybe who would like to go first? Okay, I'm not seeing them on my screen, so people have their hand oh. raised. Is that how it works? I don't quite see here. We have one in the comment section. Ah. Ah, okay. So we have a question about whether uh, that today it seems very closed off, and that it certainly is. Uh, and do I have the impression that around the 1930s, it was perhaps more open or easier to become a patron? Absolutely. It was much, much easier to do so, uh, particularly if you were outside of Gion, what was then called Gion Shinshikovu, uh, or what we now call Gion Kovu, which was the most elite district. That one there was quite difficult to get into even in the 1920s and 1930s, but other districts uh, were much, much easier to get into. So this is, again, uh, I mentioned earlier, the 1929 guidebook to the, uh, the geisha quarters of Japan uh, and the author recommending people go to Pontecho because it was just a heck of a lot easier to get in there. So yes, it did not require uh, the same sorts of hurdles that we have uh, now. Uh, Marie, thank you for the kind co uh, comment. Uh, Let's see, so Joshua is wondering whether I would consider that the modern geiko are somewhat more stymied potentially in their 20s and 30s cousins when it comes to how they're able to present themselves publicly or so you feel that the balance now is similar to then. Uh, yes, I think that you know the range of options available for what uh, geisha are to, to present themselves as, uh, you certainly don't see anything like some of the images that I showed you earlier from the modern geisha part where people are sort of experimenting with Social dance or ballroom dance as part of the, you know, again, that was never part of the official curriculum of any of the geisha schools, but individual teachers set up shop in the in the districts. And so that kind of thing uh, would just not be seen as part of, uh, of geisha culture now. I think it's now much more a kind of uh, a sense that you're preserving very important Japanese traditions and cultures and that you are a kind of repository for those that have disappeared elsewhere. But I think that we had a much more flexible approach to what geisha entertainment could look like. Again, it varied by the district. Some were a little more willing to take some chances. And I'm not an expert on districts outside of Kyoto, so it could be that in other places it was even more startling. The evidence that I've shown suggested that other places were also making similar moves. But yes, I think that the the range of how one can be a geisha has constricted a bit. Uh, but of course, people going into that know that already for the most part. So especially by the time you become a geisha, you've been doing that for four or five or six years already. So you have a good sense about what that's what's involved. Uh, a question about whether the schools and Geiko Association have influenced that change. I think so. I think, again, I'm not, I haven't gotten enough into the evidence in the post-war period to be able to understand fully how this transformed. But I do think that it became easier uh, to defend the geisha profession uh, when uh, it came under attack in the anti-prostitution campaigns. Of course, geisha were sex workers of a kind. They were in a kind of gray area of sex work. Uh, and so as people wanted to defend geisha entertainment, they needed to divorce it from the seamier aspects of the geisha districts. And so I think one path out of that was to, to create an image of the geisha as repositories of tradition. Uh, and in that way, I think that was probably encouraged by the geisha associations as well as by uh, the geisha themselves because they wanted to continue working. Uh, mm -hmm. A question, uh, yes, I'm sorry, somebody wanted to say? Uh, sorry, no, it's just, um, I think Alex has had his hand up for a while. Oh, so. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't see, I've got two <laughs> screens of people, so I can't see hands up. So Alex, That's go good. ahead, I'm sorry, apologize for that. Uh, not at all. Um, I, I feel that you know at least some of us should show our faces too. Um, a very interesting talk. Uh, my area of research is not uh, the kagai, but it's really more on um, 
Buddhism, but I'm interested in how Buddhists are responding to changes in, mm. in Japan as well. Um, and as I was listening to your talk, one question that sort of came to mind was, when we think of um, patrons and patronage in the context mm. of the Kagai, uh, the first word that might pop into people's minds is the danna, mm -hmm. you know, the males who, who, who are famous for, for mm -hmm. providing money for the, for, um, you know, the maintaining of of Geiko and Michael, but I think it might be interesting, and perhaps you could give us a little more, you know, information that you have on the role of Geiko as patron. Uh, they, you know, they've had to buy, you know, kimono, pochiri, all these other sorts of accoutrements that are part of their lives, which means they kept, um, you know, a lot of the artisanal industry in Kyoto going. And so I was just wondering um, whether your your studies of you know, the Kagai in the 1920s uh, has given you some insight on the influence of Geiko as artistic patrons. And I was wondering whether um, you can see whether, you know, in your present activities, you see the role of, of Geiko, modern Geiko. You know, Michael aren't up to that stage yet, but Geiko as, again, um, you know, patrons themselves, not just people who are patronized by others, but people who use their position to further other kinds of arts. Thank you very much. What a great question. And I had, I have, I don't have a good answer for that right now because it's a good question and I wanna think about it some more. And I think you're absolutely right. Uh, particularly in contemporary terms, you can see the geisha sort of sits at the center of a range of crafts that are kept alive because of her work. So that's absolutely right. But I really like your idea that uh, the geisha as patron and not just as patronized in the multiple meanings of that word. Um, but I, one thing that does strike me is that we also need to pay attention that I didn't talk about in this talk, but because I couldn't fit it in, but was the, that the odori are, is the big main show, but they also, all the districts perform more uh, uh, dance performances that are more for people who are really interested in dance. Uh, the, the old Odi is for the public spectacle, but these uh, other often in the fall performances are deeply for people who are really uh, students of dance. And this required enormous investments of time uh, and in finances to be able to buy the costumes, create the stage machinery. These were open to the public as well. So there, if you look at the pictures, you can see just a packed theater of people coming to see these. So there are other additional avenues of patronage for their own professional advancement, as it were, for their own professional development as dancers on the stage. So that's actually a really good point. I'd like, thank you for that. I'd like to explore that some more. Can I ask a quick follow-up? I know that other yeah. people want to ask questions, but mm -hmm. um, again, you know, the, the patron as male is a strong image, but I get the impression that you know, women too could 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 be patrons. They may not be called danna, but but I would think that women, you know, who who were interested in dance, et cetera, were, could also be perhaps more now than in the past, uh, but be you know, active in supporting um, a particular okia or a particular geiko, et cetera. So I was wondering if if your if your research has shed any sight on and you know non non geiko women who are nonetheless interested in them in the same way that women patronize takarazuka, um, even and so I, was, I think it might be another area of interest in how. You know, as you proceed with this, is how um, women of affluence use their powers of patronage to sort of express their own uh, cultural and artistic aspirations in Kyoto society, etc. That's a great point. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. It's a very good way forward, and that's why I also uh, say that I think that the uh, sometimes you'll see advertisements in the Odori program that are specifically directed at women's products, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's clear that. They are expecting lots of women to show up. It's not just Donna who are going to be there to, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to patronize the the geisha that they have chosen. So I think that's absolutely right. And uh, as I said, also these sort of more professional dance recitals uh, also become a place where women who are not geisha but who are studying in these various udiu can also come and share a kind of appreciation for uh, the art 
itself. So that's a really wonderful insight. I really appreciate that very much. That will be very helpful. Thank you very forward. much. I look forward to seeing more about this. Okay. And Laura has a hand raised, I see. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Oh. Um, I just want to say like, thank you very much for the talk. Like, I know you were talking it down a little bit in the live stream group, but I think it was really interesting. And thank you. Um, I think it's really important what you and uh, Wasak al Rasan are doing, that you're doing like the modern day equivalent of what they were doing in the 2030s, <laughs> you know, making the Karayukai and the Geisha world like more accessible for like modern people and especially the Western world. Because mm. like you said, it's very hard for Western people to access. So I've been like, so happy that like since you've set the club up, um, so I just wanted to say thank you. And um, like I know like with the live streams and the videos, um, it's mostly been Miyagawa Cho, but uh, obviously like are they more open to uh, being more like I say like you say accessible and more modern? And what would you say like the other districts versions are? Like would you say like Yon Korbu and like um Kamish again, are they like still a little bit like wary of being more open and modern and accessible. Okay, thank. Well, first of all, thank you for joining. I'm so honored that you would spend your morning uh, on <laughs> this. Thank you very much. And also thank you for bringing out that. So this, she's a member of a, a, an online club that we have created to allow people outside of Japan uh, who may also not speak Japanese to be able to uh, interact with geisha through online formats. So we have an hour long ozashiki where we talk with the geisha and Michael and also uh, uh, see them dance and uh, play games and various things. So we've been trying to work on trying to build up this uh, small thing. And you're absolutely right. I mean, the chances of Guillaume Kolbu ever signing on to a project like this is basically zero. Uh, <laughs> they, they, they're, they're not interested in this kind of a thing. Miyagawa mm -hmm. Cho is more open, but again, it also depends always on the Okia. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the one we've been working with, Shigemori is mm -hmm. much more sort of outward looking. You may remember that they had the Maiko Theater for a number of years before the pandemic. So they were already yeah. in a sense trying to make efforts to reach out beyond even Japanese visitors towards international visitors. And they have an Instagram and, you know, so they, make a lot of effort uh, to try to bring attention. So a lot of it depends one on the district and two on the individual Okio within the district. So some of them are more open and others are a little more wary uh, because of course, this is not a format they're familiar with. They're mm -hmm. familiar with face-to-face -face interactions where they entertain you and they can tell how it's going, but on this online format, they're sort of talking at a computer screen. And so it's a little yeah. bit out of their out of their comfort zone. A lot of them, I just don't really know. And so uh, I think it really does depend on the district, but we're, uh, I, we've are we been making every effort we can. We've been to Kamisitke once. Mm -hmm. uh, we went, uh, we've been working for a long time trying to convince Pontacho. We're sort of mm -hmm. on the verge of that. We hope we can get uh, one of the Okia there to to join in, uh, they seem open, but also another problem is that internet access. <laughs> a lot yeah. of the places don't have uh, wireless. All right, in the okay. Okia. Uh, mm -hmm. well, you know, the, the, the Michael-san are not allowed to have, you know, phones or anything yeah. anyway. So, so anyway, yeah. so we do have some barriers uh, sort of internal to the way the Kagai works, but we are, with your help, are doing the best we can. Yeah, well, like I say, thank you very much. Well, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll just return over to the uh, sidebar over here. Uh, I think Harold's is the first one. How is or for us, Harold? How did the Miyagawa Chokagai position itself versus Gion at Ponto Trench? Ah, ah, yes, okay. So uh, in the in the 1920s and 1930s, as I mentioned, there were uh, actually seven geisha districts. There are five now. There were seven geisha districts in Kyoto. 
And every single one of the geisha districts was a mixture of both prostitutes, licensed prostitutes, and licensed geisha. And uh, there was a kind of pecking order depending on the percentage of geisha to prostitutes within the district. And Miyagawacho had slightly more than half of Miyagawacho women working there were in prostitution and not geisha. So they had a rather low end reputation for being a little bit on the seedy side. Pontacho was, uh, Pontacho, Gion, Kobu uh, were at the high end. The, the, the least number of prostitutes were in Kamishichiken, but Kamishichiken has always been slightly isolated from the rest of the city. And so uh, it's very far away from the entertainment district. So it didn't, it had a lot of prestige, but it didn't have uh, a lot of influence because we're just so far outside of the main tourist and entertainment corridor. Gion Kovu uh, and Pontacho were considered themselves uh, rivals for sure. Uh, Miyagawacho was quite a bit further down and at the very bottom was a district that no longer exists called Kitashinshi. Uh, so there was a kind of pecking order, but a lot of it was based on the proportion of geisha to prostitutes in the district. And then Roger is asking whether I have any anecdotes about whether the Moga and Geisha then saw themselves as part of the same modern movement or an antipathy to each other, mods versus Roger. <laughs> yeah, I don't have any direct evidence of that, but I do have a couple of the pictures that I've shown of obviously fashion has taken a cue from the modern girl. And actually I did an interview with a an older geisha in Pontacho who is a third generation geisha and she showed me some pictures of her mother uh, and she was in full on moga style I mean she just was rigged up she looked fantastic but she and she was standing in front of you know one of these old wooden townhouse Ochaya buildings but she looked great so I think they're clearly I'm sure that you know the geisha are paying attention to popular styles uh, but uh, since the moga is sort of more like a cultural phenomenon rather than particular people, it's kind of hard to tell whether there was any crossover, but certainly uh, geisha were very interested in, in modern style. And then Lucille is writing uh, that in some of the programs, the geisha geisha are labeled odoriko. Do I think this is the influence of the odori implementation that was happening at the time? or did the term odoriko already exist? So I'll just take that one first. Actually, this is one of the things that's kind of intrigued me, which I don't have any evidence or not enough evidence yet. I think that the maiko is very much a tradition of gion, that gion has a kind of, uh, has over time has set the model for what geisha in Kyoto are and what the path of geisha is and the, the uniform and all of that. I think that that is very much a gion model. Uh, the term odoriko is very old uh, and I think it is striking that Pontecho does not use the term maiko uh, as far as I can tell so far what, from what I've seen. Uh, so I went through being crazy uh, I went through one of the programs and marked off everybody. They have a picture of every single person who appears, whether they are jikata, playing instruments or singing, or they are on stage. And I marked off each one to see. Uh, and all there were Michael in the pictures, but they were all listed as Odoriko along with Geisha, who were also on the stage. So it just seems like the stage. Uh, what, uh, you know, the, the people who appeared on the stage as dancers were all called odoriko, whether, whether they were geisha or whether they were uh, maiko. So that's my, so far, my understanding. And I'm sort of interested to explore this idea that uh, this geisha, uh, that the maiko, in a sense, is really a kind of gion creation that becomes sort of homogenized or generalized across all of the kagai at some point. Uh, and then whether I think the modernization move the geisha of Pontecho and Brace was influenced by the interaction with businessmen and business patrons. Uh, so yes, I mean, this is one of the very difficult things to be able to pull apart because of course, the, the Kaburenjo Theater was officially financed by the business association of the district, which of course had to be led by men. 
So it's not very, you can, there, it's very hard to be able to say definitively that geisha are the ones doing X, Y, and Z because they simply don't have the uh, ability to sign contracts, to make business negotiations, or to pronounce things publicly. They all have to be uh, by men. You may have noticed at the Shigeo Shiki in Pontocho, it's led by a city official, a male, not by uh, the geisha of the district. So uh, men have to have a public facing role. And so I think it's unsadly at this point been very, very difficult to try to recover what geisha themselves were doing. But I am absolutely convinced, uh, knowing older geisha that you do know, these are not women who just take it lightly. Uh, they are people who are in charge. So I, but it is, um, it is difficult to be able to uh, pull that apart, unfortunately. Uh, and Marie is saying that the geisha were also seen as independent, free thinking uh, bad girls. Would you say that they are socially acknowledged considering the word bad girls? I always felt that they were socially more accepted than, for example, the Karyukistan were also acknowledged as prostitute. So, uh, yeah, so I, I, I get where you're going. And I think that in contemporary terms, that's probably true, particularly for the Michael more so than the geisha, but the Michael especially so. Jan Bardsley's book has really shown that extremely well. But I think that in the 1920s and 1930s, the association of geisha with public display, uh, being on stage with uh, sex work, either engaged in sex work because of their own work or working with sex workers alongside sex workers made geisha very, very radioactive among people of proper moral sensibilities. Uh, and I think we see that uh, among uh, people, as I mentioned earlier, there was uh, some discussion about whether or not geisha should be allowed to participate in the celebrations for the Taisho emperor's enthronement. And a large part of that is because, in a sense, they're seen as bad girls. That is, they're not married. Uh, they engage in promiscuous sexuality. Uh, they are on stage and publicly acknowledged. So they are, in many ways, uh, the opposite of what a woman is supposed to be. And they often have children out of wedlock, too. Uh, and so they're engaged in a lot of behaviors that certainly uh, tainted their image in the broader public. Uh, Nicholas is saying that talking about distinguishing themselves away from any association of prostitution, what is the view regarding Western media that tends to mislead audiences about the gay Michael community, such as memoirs of a geisha? Yeah, it's, you know, it's a very, very, very sensitive problem or, or issue because it is clear that geisha were expected to participate in sex work to a certain degree. Uh, but if you say that, then of course, you just seem to reintroduce all of the, the flood of stereotypes that gets associated with that. So I think we need to be able to understand the range of sex work employment that uh, existed for women uh, in Japan in the 19 teens and 1920s and 30s, just as we see a range of different uh, sex workers of various kinds, some online, some casual sex work who work occasionally and then come back into sex work and then do other work. So uh, I think there's just simply no way around getting uh, through the fact that in the 1920s and 30s, sex work was part of a geisha's job description. Uh, but how much that occurred is, of course, very difficult to apprehend. Uh, again, with the passage of the anti-prostitution law, that, of course, makes the whole situation quite different than it used to be. And so uh, now, of course, the geisha are struggling very hard to try to uh, convince people, particularly outside of Japan, that their work doesn't involve sex. Uh, so it is a very, very sensitive topic. I'm always really reluctant to bring it up as a historian. I think we need to face it and, and to actually, I think that we can admire these women even more that they put up with this. But if you do, then you, uh, you tend to reinforce these kinds of attitudes. So I'm sort of ambivalent about it all together. Uh, Monica is wondering whether the attitude of Pontecho Geiko to modernize herself in the past can still be seen today, the difference and in some way contrast with Gion in the past. 
produce results that still be present or in a car I tend to getting closer again. So yeah, so we're thinking about the relationship between the various Kagai or various geisha districts. There's always been a rivalry between all of the geisha districts and there still is in a sense of a friendly rivalry. Still, of course, you, you know, you want to believe that your district is the best for, for, you know, that the, the, you know, the Kamishigen prides itself on having the best dancers, uh, you know, so the, the Gion Kobu had the best all around Michael, I mean, the, you know, most rounded, well, well groomed. So they all maintain a sense of their own identity, but because the number of geisha is quite small now and, and Maiko is quite small now, of course, they have to band together. They're all in the same boat. Uh, in the 19 teens and 1920s, the number of geisha uh, and was hovering around 2000. Uh, now it's about uh, what, 150, 180, depending on the time. So they, in a sense, don't have the luxury of having those kinds of rivalries with each other anymore, but they certainly do maintain a sense of their own independence uh, and are proud of their traditions. Uh, and Angel is wondering whether I'll be including in this research more on the concept from modern to museum. And do I have any thoughts about what this change might mean for Geisha in the future? Well, I, I'm guessing that this is the path forward, in fact, for Geisha. I mean, this is what brings people to Kyoto to see. They want to see this kind of, you know, remnant of a disappearing Japan. Uh, and so in that way, we can see that it's, uh, you know, just as Geisha in the 1920s and 30s thought that, you know, trying to be modern and trying out new ideas was going to be the path forward that could sustain the profession. Uh, it may be that now uh, with the small numbers that they have, the best way to maintain it is to give off the, uh, the sense that they're maintaining vital traditions that are getting overwhelmed by modern and contemporary society. So I don't know, that might be the might be the last chapter of a book if this ever turns into a book the, from the modern to the museum. But that's just an idea. And of course, it would also involve uh, some interviews, which are always very, very difficult to arrange because most Geisha and Michael don't really like to talk about things that go on behind the curtain, as it were. Uh, so if there's anybody that wants to speak a question, I've been reading off the question list over here, but if any, I'll give a break if you want to speak a question, anybody? If not, I will go on to Sean O'Reilly's question wondering whether either in the interwar period or more recently the boundaries of geisha as a concept have ever approached a ship of theseus paradox stretching so much that they are were no longer recognizable to sorters and our critics this tension between proactive change and conservatism seems fascinating even in the freewheeling interwar period for instance in some Images you showed some visual markers of geisha hood remain instantly familiar, such as the relatively limited range of hairstyles, as though the definition of geisha is strongly tied to the visual surface. I'm sorry, oh, no, it's a great comment. That's yeah, I I I really think that's a fascinating question, and I think that the dance geisha is where the rubber hits the road on that. I think that that's where you, you know, as I mentioned, I showed just very briefly. I didn't have go into it much, but showed just a, a round table discussion about, is this really a good idea or not? Uh, with some people saying, well, look, we've got to modernize or else this whole thing is going to go extinct. And others saying, that's not what Geisha do. You just hire dancers for that. You don't, you know, this is not what we do. So I do think that this puts the Geisha profession into a sense of self-reflection. And I think that what's so interesting is that that's a constant process. I think that the post-war period of the museumification, if I can create a word, in a sense, covers over the innovations that have occurred and that that museum style is also yet another version of this thinking about what a geisha is and what a geisha does. So what I, I guess, because I'm a historian and I study change over time, what interests me is, 
each of these various stages of geisha development are very self-consciously considered, experimented with, and there emerges a consensus about what makes a geisha a geisha. And I'm not sure that geisha today would embrace dance geisha. I mean, they would just say that's not geisha. But, and of course, at the time, there were others among their community that also said, well, I'm not really sure that's geisha at all. But there were other lots and lots of geisha who said, this is great. I mean, this is what, uh, what the future is. So I do think that what's so fascinating that this I hope, in a sense, opens up is to allow us to think of geisha historically, not as simply preserving 200 years of the same dress and the same hairstyle and the same culture and everything just exactly the same, because that's how they sell it now. But in a way, I think that robs the women of their enormous creativity by overlooking that. And so, and their ability to think for themselves about what geisha means, what it's about. So. Uh, so I, I'm not sure I'm really answering your question or your comment, but that's sort of where I'm going. And I think that's very helpful for me to keep thinking of along those lines. So I appreciate that uh, idea. Yeah, thank uh, you very much. Thank you. Did you have a follow up? John? I think it was very helpful. So. No, not really, but yeah, no, that's uh, food for thought for sure. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, and then Angel is wondering about what was the district uh, Kitashinchi. So it actually uh, divided into two districts uh, uh, sometime in the 1920s. I don't remember the exact date. Uh, so the, the number of geisha districts sort of fluctuated over time, but uh, Kitashinchi, yeah, Kitashinchi, you got it right there. So, uh, and then, Oh, so Lucille is writing. Oh, oh, help me out. That's great. Thank you, Lucille. You're helping me out a lot. Uh, Pardon. And hmm, go ahead. Can I, Lucille. can I do a follow up question to Please. that? I'm sorry. Of course. So I'm sorry. I just wanted to clarify. Um, my understanding is that Kitashinchi is part of Osaka, not Kyoto. So that's why I'm confused. Can you can you expand on that? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so Kitashinchi is a district in Osaka, but it also was part of the, as I as I understand it, uh, it was part of the Gojo Rakuen split off from Kitashinchi. So the Gojo Rakuen, which you wrote in there, had a northern part of it, uh, and Gojo Rakuen split off, and so the Kitashinchi was largely seen as, I'm I'm forgetting. One basically became a prostitution district, and the other became a geisha district. But I don't remember which one went in either way. But uh, that they they were originally one larger district and split in sometime in the 1920s or 30s. I'm still a little vague on it. But uh, Lucille, do you know more? Are you know more than I do? Probably so. Uh, Harold is asking about if I've ever seen a diary of a Taisho geisha to get more of their voices. So far, uh, no, but uh, there are, for reasons I'm not quite sure, there were actually a large number of memoirs by Gion geisha published uh, in the late 90s into the early 2000s. And they are all by women who are in their 80s and 90s. And so they were geisha in the Taisho, Michael and geisha in the Taisho period. And they offer some pretty interesting insights. But I also think that, again, Gion tends to dominate uh, the other districts in the broader representation of geisha life and the meaning of geisha hood. So those are really helpful. Uh, they talk about the training, they talk about how they got into the geisha profession, uh, oftentimes sort of, you know, shading over some of the less savory details, of course. But those have been very helpful. But again, I'm always a little bit leery because it tends to be that Gion dominates uh, what geisha is. So the, the, I don't, I have not yet run across any uh, accounts by Pontecho geisha yet. I'm sure there may be some out there. But I also began trying to do some oral history interviews with uh, senior geisha in Pontecho. 
Uh, and then COVID came and of course, didn't seem like a good idea to be going to older geishas houses and interviewing them. So that sort of got off the rails, but I got started on that. And that's another possibility. Of course, they themselves were not geisha in the Taisho period, but many of them are second or third generation geisha. And so uh, they often have stories of their mother and grandmother as well. So that's another possibility. So we'll, we'll see. So I hope so. And Angel is wondering, with the changes to their profession, as mentioned, do you think the Kagai must open up to more to survive in the long run? After all, most modern people are not interested in tradition. Uh, so, well, it's hard to know. Um, it depends on the district too. Uh, several of the districts are, uh, I mean, the basic, model of them is their exclusivity. Uh, and so if you give that up and just sort of become a general service provider, uh, in some ways you drive away the very people that you hope will be clients, uh, the kind of people that will like the exclusivity of it and the sort of the education and culture required. So I, I think they're sort of in a difficult position um, and I think they're also very wary of getting themselves involved in the tourist trade to any significant degree. Um, they're just not geared towards that kind of hospitality, but then of course it's a possible way for making some money, which they really, really need. So I think the business model is quite difficult, but I'm not an expert on it in any way. I'm sure that Lucille probably knows a great deal more than I do about it. So if anybody has knowledge themselves and want to contribute, that'd be great. I don't, I'm not an expert on their contemporary business model. Any other thoughts or questions or is everybody just exhausted and want to go <laughs> lie down or? Maybe just to give you a bit of a break from reading and uh, <laughs> fielding questions, Gavin, if it's okay, I'll, I'll pose a couple of myself. Um, so uh, I think was one of the fascinating things uh, since you started out with this discussion of Moga, right? Um, and I, I'm drawing here from the work of Barbara Sato specifically, mm -hmm. uh, was that it the figure of it, any anyway, the modern girl, inspires so much debate and kind of brouhaha over the over um, well her image, her mm -hmm. her definition certainly, yeah. um, even when uh, at a time when there weren't really that many of them. Uh, where they were supposed to be in Ginza. Um, so I'm wondering if like, you know, there's a similar kind of um, uh, discursive, uh, I don't know, debates, should we call it, or kind of discussion about, and changes being done to, or the changes being undertaken by these uh, sections or these uh, mm -hmm. these factions <laughs> of, of uh, factions of the geisha world. Um, and on a side note as well, uh, it's a really fascinating uh, range of, of images uh, and sources that you showed in, this, in the presentation. I'm wondering if, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't want to kind of like endlessly push, uh, right, the, the research, um, but I'm wondering if there's uh, other mediums that you are kind of uh, pursuing in kind of developing this research, right? Um, I think a lot of the presence of kabuki actors in, in kind of early film, but I wonder if, you know, do, do geisha get involved in that kind of uh, mass media as well? Um, I think maybe to, to not to always come back to Moga, but uh, since Moga were also kind of these uh, uh, confluence points of, yes, fashion, but also film and music and dance, uh, do kind of geisha get involved in the, kind of the early experiments with uh, sound recording or anything like that? Yes, that that is so exciting because in fact, there are geisha who become recording stars, mostly Tokyo geisha. There are, and this is in the, you know, 20s and 30s we're talking about. There are geisha who also transition to the movie screen. So there are, and we see geisha in advertising. They're advertising, you know, sort of plugging all kinds of products. So in some ways, I'm, I didn't have time to digest the material well enough at this point, but I want to think of them in a sense as uh, their bodies in a sense brought 
Japan together, brought Japan into the modern age. Their voices on phonograph records and their images on innumerable kinds of media, including painting both yoga and Nihonga. I mean, Nihonga and yoga artists are, you know, are disagreeing on a lot, but they can all agree that Michael particularly are worthy of paying attention to and drawing. So I think that's interesting. I think they are, uh, many of the images that I showed today are postcards. And I like to think that, you know, geisha are traveling across these routes all across Japan and bringing in a sense, modern communication to the rest of Japan. It's their bodies, it's their work, it's their creativity that is at the center of this sort of engine of modernity. So I am interested in exploring the various forms of media that, that turn towards them and to which they deploy themselves. So I think that's really, really helpful. Uh, and now I blanked on the first part of the question. Can you remind me again? <laughs> Sorry, I was a bit long. Um, uh, I wanted to ask if there's a, you know, a similar kind of, uh, kind of uh, extended, uh, very, I mean, with when it comes to Moga, there were so many like different definitions of what mm -hmm. she was and what her, or what the quote unquote problem of her was. Um, so I want, and not just, you know, amongst Moga, who seem to quite be somewhat absent in, in a lot of documents anyways. Uh, it's more about people speaking <laughs> about That's Moga. Right. That's right. Um, uh, even when they were kind of few in number. So right. I wonder if there's that kind of similar kind of public uh, outcry to some extent when it comes to like these changes with geisha, right, with a Pontocho geisha kind of taking on these new forms of artistic expression or kind of experiments with the art. Or is that kind of just, uh, maybe it's less scandalous because it's, I'm not sure, because it's seen as this, this separate, more closed off world, even if incorrectly. Mm. Yeah, I really like that. And I don't know how to answer right now. My research isn't fully developed enough to give you an answer worth delivering. But the thing that I always get a little bit wary about is that much of the research about geisha is about the image of geisha or what people are saying about geisha, just like you were saying with the moga, right? How many moga are there and who are they? And, you know, can we talk to them? But, you know, it's mostly people with sort of wild speculation about, you know, these crazy women out here, what are they doing? So, so in some ways, I think that we have really excellent research already on images of geisha in popular discourse. And if it's possible, I want to be able to figure out what they think about themselves. And I think the, the best way into that is this magazine that began publishing in 1927, if I get it, if I'm correct, called Gige Krabu. Uh, and this magazine was published in Kyoto and it, it chronicles the it's a monthly magazine and it chronicles the events of all of the seven Kagai in Kyoto and talks about, you know, every month what's going on, you know, just, and it also has round table discussions about various issues and kind of reportage about the, the Kyoto geisha community. And it, and it continues for about 15 years or so, something I think it ends around uh, the early 1940s or late 1930s. I don't have all the issues at hand, so I don't know. But the difficulty there, of course, is that again, it's male journalists writing these stories. It's not the geisha themselves, but I'm hoping uh, that through that journal, I will be able to try to get a sense about, uh, as I showed very briefly, one of the articles that was in there was that kind of round table about the dance geisha. Was this a good idea? Now they don't quote anybody in particular. They just have sort of arranged, you know, some people say this and some people say that. So you don't really, you can't tie a quotation to an individual person. But my interest really is in trying to think about geisha from their point of view and how they understood their profession. So I'm hoping that that journal, if we can read it in a sophisticated way, will allow us to try to recover some of their own points of view. Great, thanks so much. All right.
Well, I think everybody needs to go lie down and have a stiff drink of bourbon or something. So 